All right, uh, this is the project update for Oslo. And I'm Ben Nemec. I work for Red Hat. I'm the current PTL. Uh, we also have Moises, Doug, and Ken, who are Oslo cores in the room. And yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So just in case you accidentally walked all the way down here and don't know what Oslo is, uh, it is kind of the location that all of the common libraries for OpenStack live. So if we have multiple projects that are trying to do basically the same thing, we try to factor that code out, put it in Oslo, and then it can be all maintained in one place and everybody benefits. So as a result of that philosophy, our team is kind of a combination of generalist code reviewers who are, you know, people who have demonstrated that they know how to design an API and, you know, are, are good at reviewing Python code. And then there's also specialist API maintainers who are responsible for maybe just one or two libraries and have a lot of specific knowledge for that library so they can kind of help us with the, you know, domain specific things. Um, one of the things that I learned the last time I was doing one of these project updates was that independent contributors are actually one of the, the biggest groups in Oslo, which is kind of cool for a, you know, kind of corporate environment like OpenStack usually is. Uh, we have a, a lot of people who are not necessarily corporate contributors. contributors. Uh, we have around 40 projects still, and you can see a few of the things that we cover there. Uh, we added a new one this cycle, and we might add more. And if you want more details, the, the wiki page is there, and I, I believe these slides will be published on the um, foundation site, so you should be able to find it afterwards if you want to. Uh, it should also be recorded, so. Uh, things that we've gotten done. The, this was kind of the first um, step towards getting secrets out of the configuration files because I know that's been a, a long-standing pain point in OpenStack that we have passwords and tokens and whatnot that go in plain text files on the, the hard disk and a lot of organizations really, really don't like that. So um, we, we got started this cycle with uh, a driver framework that allows us to pull um, configuration data from other locations. So for this cycle, we got a remote file driver done. And basically what that does is it goes out to a web server and pulls down a configuration file, and then it kind of merges those values in with the ones that are on the, the local file. And you can see an example there of how you would configure that in your local file. So there's, there's some local configuration, but none of the secrets go in there. So um, it's an improvement. This is only the first step. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit later about uh, kind of the next step in getting rid of secrets in configuration files, and we'll get to that in a bit. Also on the config, config front, uh, we added a validator, and that's another thing that has been requested for quite a long time. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to look at the sample configuration data that all of the projects are already publishing for generating their sample config files. and it will go through the list of options and then look at the configuration file that you pass it. And if there's anything in the configuration file that doesn't show up in the project options, it's either going to error at you or if you're using deprecated options, that'll be a warning. So it's kind of handy for that. The one big limitation that I know of right now with it is it doesn't handle dynamic groups. So like for Cinder, if you're validating a, a configuration file that has one of those dynamic groups in it, it's probably going to error at you. You'll just have to look at the, the options for now and decide whether it's a legitimate failure or just a dynamic group. Um, we can probably fix that. It, we just haven't yet. Um, and then you can see the, the example. There's, there's actually two different ways you can call it. You can either pass it directly the, the project um, sample config file. That's that first one there. Um, or you can use the config generator to generate a machine readable file that contains all of the option data, and then you can pass that in. And that's kind of handy if you're on a production system where maybe you don't have the, the source code for the project available. We also, uh, the new library that we added was the Oslo Upgrade Check Library, and that was to support the, the community goal for upgrade checkers. And basically that's where we put all of kind of the, the common processing code for the checks and some CLI helper stuff. So. Um, you can see an example down there of this is just the uh, output if you run basically the documented sample code that we have for the project. So yeah, if you're, if you're writing upgrade checks, hopefully that's useful. 
We also added fair locks to Oslo concurrency this cycle. That's another thing that has periodically come up over the years. Uh, for the moment, we're only guaranteeing it for the internal locks, which is um, within one process. Uh, for external locks that, that you might be using for inner process locking, uh, it's dependent on how the operating system implements their file locks. So we can't really guarantee that. And I spent a lot of time looking at the Linux kernel code, trying to figure out if it's fair or not. And uh, we ran across a comment that basically said, it makes sense to implement this in a fair way, but we don't document it. So, so you, you probably shouldn't count on that, but it, it probably works. And I have no idea what it, what it does on other operating systems. So Windows, you'll have to go talk to Microsoft. Some other noteworthy changes that aren't features. Um, we, we removed some things and deprecated some things in PBR. Uh, we removed the Python version specific requirements files. And those shouldn't be needed anymore because uh, PIP and setup tools and friends have grown support for specifying a Python version in your requirements files. So you don't need those anymore. Hopefully nobody's using them and they're gone. We also deprecated a couple of the setup.py commands. Um, so for testing, you should be running stester directly instead of calling setup.py test. Um, these are deprecated, so they're still there, but you should really be trying to migrate off of them. And then uh, build sphinx was also deprecated. And there again, just use sphinx build directly. Um, it's better, it's less fragile. We had a lot of breakages because of the PBR integration with sphinx. And so if you're just calling sphinx build directly, hopefully that won't happen anymore. Um, the functionality that was PBR specific has either moved to OpenStack docs theme or the Sphinx Contrib API doc project. And there was one, one small Sphinx extens extension left in um, PBR for non OpenStack projects who aren't using OpenStack docs theme. So they have a migration path as well. And the other big removal we had this cycle was the zero MQ driver. It hasn't been maintained for years, and we're pretty sure it doesn't work with current versions of OpenStack because they didn't implement some new features that uh, projects are requiring. So um, it's gone. If you want it back, talk to Ken. <laughs> so things that are upcoming in the near future, hopefully. Um, as I mentioned, we had another another config driver that is in progress, and that's to store secrets using Castellan. And so that, that gives you some flexibility on what your backend is, and, and it's a lot more secure than just having a file out on a web server somewhere that basically anybody can get to. Um, this one should be a lot better for security and hopefully addresses all of the concerns that people have had with uh, secrets and config files. Um, another config. Uh, driver that we added, actually, this one has just merged, and apparently we released it already, too, because um, I had somebody tell me that they started using it today. So that was good. Um, but this one this one reads the values from the environment. So uh, you can see there we, we um, map the, the group and the option name to an environment variable name, and then it will go out and look for that environment variable. And if it finds it, then it'll use the value from there. And the reason that we added this one was so with containers, you theoretically now don't need to have a configuration file baked into it. You can just pass everything in through the environment. So it, it fits the container um, deployment workflow a little bit better. Uh, we also have a, a more config work. Um, we have a config migrator that is getting pretty close to merging, I think. And what it does is it takes a configuration file from one version and basically prepares it for the next version of OpenStack. So like if, if an option was renamed, it will automatically move that value from the old name to the new name. Um, it has support for uh, custom functions within the services. So if they, you know, if there's a, a complex change that needs to happen in the migration, you can do that through, um, through that callback. Um, it doesn't handle everything, so like for the, the transport URL that we changed in Oslo Messaging, it, it wouldn't handle that case yet. Uh, we have some plans to deal with that in the future, uh, but the, the first release probably won't do that. But hopefully this will, this will be helpful and, and get people a, a start on their, their upgrades. And then 
This is Ken's topic, so I don't know if you want to come up and talk about it. Mostly read, read from that slide anyway, so oh, this is actually Andy's topic, and Andy couldn't make it here today. Uh, so we had uh, uh, an internal goal of getting the um, Kafka notification driver, that's Kafka support for notifications, done in Rocky, and we, you know, that heard the sound of that milestone whizzing past us. Uh, because we had a lot of problems with the implementation uh, due to uh, threading issues with the uh, Python library we were using. We were using the original um, Kafka Python library, but that had problems with event line. I think it was doing operating system, um, blocking at the operating system level, like a select or something, socket calls. So we've moved to Confluent uh, Kafka and integrated, um, I think it's um, eventlet T pools in the case of eventlets, and that seems to be working. So. Um, We've got that review up. Um, sorry, and I think uh, that's it. Yeah. So we're making a thread safe is what we've got to complete in Rocky and experimental. Yeah, through T. So should be usable, at least feature complete um, in Stein. All right. So we also have a uh, change, I think it's still in progress, but it's, once again, it's, uh, I think, getting close uh, for Oslo proofs up to allow it to process requests in parallel. Previously, it could only do one thing at a time, so uh, again, Cinder keeps coming up. Um, they, they have some privileged calls that can take a little bit of time, and so they, they couldn't let those be serialized and, you know, just keep stacking up. So we're, we're working on adding a thread pool to Oslo Privsep so that it can process multiple calls at once and then that should uh, get past that blocking issue. Uh, we also have some work in progress to um, enable plugins for the Oslo policy and that will allow people to use external policy engines. Um, we've actually done some work on this in the past but it was just to enable HTTP check. Uh, to call out to an external uh, service. So that one works, but it requires a, a fair amount of work when you're deploying it, and it required a proxy between Oslo Policy and the actual policy en engine. So we're, we're doing this kind of as a next step to improve that support, and the design is still in progress, so if you have interest in this, um, go out and take a look at the spec that's linked there and provide your input. Uh, so cross project work, uh, like I said, all all of it. Um, it's uh, kind of the nature of Oslo that everything we work on is is touching multiple projects. So um, yeah, uh, specific things that we'll be working on. Um, Oslo dot limit is something we actually introduced last cycle, and uh, so we're we're working closely with some of the project teams to figure out how exactly we're going to integrate that with the services and we're, we're still refining the API there because um, as we've started doing some of the more cross-project work, we've discovered that um, there were some limitations there and we needed a little bit of um, rethinking there. So, but good progress there. Uh, the Oslo config drivers, that's probably going to be mostly deployment tool work because Obviously, if you're storing some of your um, configuration options in an external location or eventually in Castellan or whatever the back end is there, uh, that's, that changes your deployment workflow quite a bit. So there will most likely be some, some effort needed there. Uh, as I mentioned, the config migrator has support for some um, custom code in projects, and so if projects are getting into scenarios where they need to use that, then obviously we need to, to get those things implemented in the project, so uh, we'll need some coordination there. And then just in general, we, you know, every cycle we're updating projects to try to remove dependencies on deprecated or removed features, so, you know, obviously that's, that's necessary before we do the removals because we don't really want to break anybody if we can help it. So that was it for, for work that we're doing. Uh, if you're interested in giving feedback, you can see the launch pad link there, and we've started looking at the storyboard migration, so hopefully that's coming soon. Don't know exactly when, but keep an eye out for it. 
run OpenStack Oslo on Freenode, and we use the Oslo tag on OpenStack Dev and soon OpenStack Discuss. And if you're interested in contributing, um, be aware you don't need to be full time on Oslo. I don't think any of us are full time on Oslo. We pretty much all have other projects that we work on, so um, we're, we're totally cool with that. Uh, a good way to start is just to pick a project that sounds interesting, review the code, fix some bugs if they are. Well, we, I think we have bugs for at least one bug for every project, so <laughs> you shouldn't have trouble finding one. Um, and you certainly don't have to know all of Oslo to contribute to, to you know, one specific library. That's, that's one of the nice things. A lot of these libraries are kind of small and self-contained, so it's a, a good way to get involved. And we're particularly interested in some new owners for Oslo.Service, Oslo.PrivSep, and maybe Taskflow, although there's been some discussion about moving that one out of the Oslo project and making it independent. Um, but even if that happens, I'm sure they'd still like more contributors. So. Uh, those are, those are some important projects that, uh, you know, most of the, or a lot of open, uh, OpenStack projects are depending on and we're, we're kind of light on um, maintainers for them, so looking for help. And I think that, that was it for the presentation. Any questions before we close? All right. I think we're right on time, so. Woo.